You may have heard about a French artist by the name of Paul Gustave Doré. Uh, he lived in the 1800s, and you may not recognize the name, but you might recognize one of the pictures that he did. It was a rendering of Camelot, uh, the castle of, of King Arthur. You may uh, have seen that before. He was uh, very famous at that time, and there was an account shared that he was traveling throughout Europe, or actually he was beginning a trip throughout Europe, and he got to a border and he realized he did not have his passport. So he thought, well, maybe they will know my name, and so I'll just tell them who I am, and maybe they'll let me through. And uh, when he got to the, to the border there, the security guard, the border guard said, well, you know, people try this all the time, so, you know, I, I really just can't let you go because you tell me what your name is, even if you are a famous person. So he went and he talked with some other uh, people there that were part of the border uh, security and, and uh, came back to the man, and he said, well, we've got this uh, idea. If you, can, if you can prove to us that you really are Paul Gustave Doré, um, here is a notepad and a pencil. We want you to draw that crowd of people over there. And so he took it, and much to the surprise of the security guards, he drew them very accurately and very quickly, and, uh, and they were convinced, well, he must be Doré. And so they let him through the border. They let him continue in his way. His work confirmed his word. And throughout the opening chapters of Mark's gospel, that is exactly what we've been seeing. We've been seeing miracles. We've been seeing healings, uh, the provision of food, setting free from demons. All of these works that Mark recounts in the opening chapters are pointing to the fact that the word of Jesus Christ has been confirmed by his works. And so we will see that Uh, Today as well, as we look at at other miracles, we will see that he authenticates his identity as the divine son of God. And that is really the focus of the first eight chapters. Mark's gospel, chapters one through eight are, are describing that Jesus is divine. He's able to do things that no one else can do because of his divine nature as the son of God. Now, as we get into the messages next week and following, we're going to see a shift take place. Rather than the emphasis being the divinity of Christ, the emphasis will be upon him being the promised Messiah, the suffering servant. And so we'll look more at that, Lord willing, next Sunday. But today we're still considering what it is when we see these miracles and to see that they describe him as uh, and define him as a divine, the divine son of God. Now in the text that we'll be reading today, we're going to be looking at a few different groups of people. And one thing we'll notice is that different groups have different responses. And as you think about it, the same is true even today. There are some people that respond very quickly to Christ. They respond eagerly, enthusiastically. There may be some that they're they're more measured. Maybe it's it's a slower response, more methodical, more questions. For some, unfortunately, you see that that they, they don't respond with belief at all and to some degree even can be antagonistic towards Christ. And so a variety of groups, a variety of people, a variety of responses, and we will see all of that here as we move through chapter 8. So let's begin in verse 1. It says, In those days there was again a large crowd, and they had nothing to eat. He called the disciples and said to them, I have compassion on the crowd because they've already stayed with me three days and have nothing to eat. And I know what you're thinking. Haven't we already read this? Well, this is a different occasion. We've seen the feeding of the 5,000. This is the feeding of the 4,000. It's a different location, different group of people. The scenario is similar, but there are some differences. Look again at verse 3. If I send them home hungry, they will collapse on the way, and some of them have come a long distance. His disciples answered him, Where can anyone get enough bread here in this desolate place to feed these people? How many loaves do you have? He asked them. Seven, they said. He commanded the crowd to sit down on the ground, taking the seven loaves. He gave thanks, broke them, and gave them to his disciples to set before the people. So they served them to the crowd. They also had a few small fish. And after he had blessed them, he said these were to be served as well. They ate and were satisfied. Then they collected seven large baskets of leftover pieces. About 4,000 were there. He dismissed them. He immediately got into the boat with his disciples and went to the district of Dalmanthua. And so as we consider this account, 
we see a group. And I've divided the message into scenes. This is the first scene. The scene is a crowd. The crowd was introduced to Jesus. And again, a few chapters back, we saw the feeding of the 5,000. This is the feeding of the 4,000. And there's, uh, there's some, some similarities and differences. But I think the, uh, the, the, the biggest difference, the most significant difference, has to do with the groups of people. The 5,000 were exclusively Jewish people. The 4,000, on the other hand, this is an account in a Gentile area, Gentile region. So these are the Gentiles. And just as the Jews got to see the miraculous feeding, now the Gentiles get to see Christ feed them miraculously. They needed, needed to know as well about his identity, his divine identity, his unique power to multiply food, something obviously they'd never seen before. And beyond his power and ability, there's more to learn about Jesus in this as well. In fact, if you think about the use of bread throughout the Bible, you can even look back to the Old Testament times. You can think about the parallels we have here with Moses. Do you remember Moses was, was a, a rescuer? He was a redeemer of the people out of, uh, out of Egypt. And as they were in the wilderness and they had nothing to eat, what happened? There was manna that came. They were provided this bread of life, if you will. And Jesus is like a Moses. Now he's, he's, he's a stronger and better Moses, obviously, but he's a rescuer. He's a redeemer. He's a provider. And he himself is providing them physical food, but he's also wanting to demonstrate that he is the bread of life. If you remember from Exodus chapter 16, this account of the manna, when the layer of dew evaporated, there were fine flakes on the desert surface, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they asked one another, what is it? Because they didn't know what it was. Moses told them, it is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. And so in a similar way, Jesus is feeding the hungry in a miraculous way. And he's also identifying himself as the bread of heaven. Now, you know that many of these miracles are recorded in different gospels. And John's gospel also recorded uh, the feeding of the 5,000. And it was in this that, that Jesus gave further explanation. John chapter 6, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that anyone may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. The bread that I will give you for the life of the world is my flesh. And so Jesus is making parallels. Yes, he's feeding them with physical bread, but he's also stating in a spiritual way that he is the ultimate provider, that he will, he will lay down his life. They will live as they accept him. And from the beginning of his earthly life, Jesus has had a unique connection to bread. You remember, he was born in the town of Bethlehem. Bethlehem means literally house of bread. That's, that's, that's what the meaning is. It was an area that produced a lot of grain. And so this idea of the house of bread or the city of bread is where he was born. And on the final night of his earthly life, he would gather together with his disciples and where they would have a meal and he would give them bread and he would say, take eat. This is my body given for you. And so even a few weeks ago, when we received the Lord's supper, we took the element of bread, reminding us of Jesus being the bread of life. And so the, the imagery here, the symbolism is, uh, is seen firsthand uh, here with the feeding of the 4,000. He wants them to understand the spiritual provision beyond the physical. But beyond providing, there's also something else we see. If you look back to verse 2, he says, I have compassion on the crowd. Compassion. So yes, he is a God of provision, but let's not miss the fact that he's also a God of compassion. And this might have been striking in that particular time because they were not with their people, right? They were on the other side of the lake in a Gentile region. And Jesus is saying, I'm feeding them and I have compassion on them. I think there's a message there for us as we think about Christ's compassion about uh, among those, uh, towards those whom weren't part of his people, if you will. I think there's a, a connection there for us that, that maybe it's one thing for us to exhibit compassion and care within the church family for one another, but, but what are our thoughts when we think beyond these walls? When we think about those in the, in the community or in other parts of the world, does the compassion of Christ 
still resonate. James Edwards said there is a lesson here for the people of God in every age, that its enemies are neither forsaken by God nor beyond the compassion of Jesus. On the contrary, the Gentiles, like others a long distance away, are the objects of Jesus' compassion. And so again, we don't want to miss that word we see in these opening verses, the compassion of Christ and his provision. And yet there's another group that we'll see, and there's a bit of a contrast between the group of Gentiles and the next group, because the next group is uh, a group of Jewish spiritual leaders whom we've already been introduced to, and that is the Pharisees. Look at verse 11. It says, the Pharisees came and began to argue with him, demanding of him a sign from heaven to test him. Sighing deeply in his spirit, he said, why does this generation demand a sign? Truly, I tell you, no sign will be given to this generation. Then he left them, got back into the boat and went to the other side. And so we see a lot of traveling here, right? A lot of back and forth on the lake. We finish the, uh, uh, the feeding of the 4,000, they go across the lake. Finishes this encounter with the Pharisees, back in the boat, across the lake. But uh, we see here in this, in this scene, the Pharisees. And they tested and rejected Jesus. They tested and rejected him. Now, we're back into probably an area near Capernaum, a Jewish area, where the Pharisees would come and, and, uh, and meet with him. Now, this isn't his first encounter with the Pharisees. They've already challenged him before. In fact, it was just a few weeks ago, we were looking at their traditions of the elders, if you remember, and how they, they elevated those even above the commandments of God. We had a little thought about, about the dangers of legalism that Sunday, and he was pointing out the legalism of the Pharisees. Well, they're back again, and they're ready to argue, and they're ready to test. And uh, in fact, they're even asking uh, for a sign. Now, they had already seen signs. They had already seen uh, him teach. They, they'd already uh, had that demonstrated, and yet they wanted to do it again. If you look at verse 11, we see that their motivation was to test him. And so, of course, Jesus knows their hearts. He knows their motivation, and he's not willing to play their games. And so he doesn't do it. He's not going to participate. And so the response that we see here, the first one is denial. Jesus is denying their request. If you look at the end of verse 12, truly I tell you, no sign will be given to this generation. Now that may surprise us a little bit. We might think, wait a minute, we're so used to seeing Jesus have these encounters where he just enters into the dialogue and he goes ahead and says, and he, they give a point, he gives a counterpoint. Not this time. It's as if this time he's, he's already given them what he's going to give them and he's not going to... Uh, uh, to move forward. Now, remember, they had continually and persistently refused Christ. Remember several chapters ago when we were in Mark chapter 3, they were described, the scribes who had come down from Jerusalem said, he is possessed by Beelzebul. He drives out demons by the ruler of the demons. So we have seen throughout the book of Mark this rejection over and over again. And uh, they had had ample opportunity to respond, but that was not what was going to happen this time. In fact, look at verse 13 again. Then he left them, got back into the boat, and went to the other side. Is that not also just a little striking? I mean, here they, they, they are coming to find Jesus. They, 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 are, they want to argue with him. They want to challenge him. They want to test him. And then they see him get in a boat and leave. I think there is something here for us to consider, that there may be a time for them, maybe a time for each one of us where there are no more signs, no more help and understanding. Is there a warning here in just picturing Jesus departing this scene? The one who is not trusted in Christ cannot assume that there will be future opportunities. In fact, I was reminded of Isaiah chapter 55. It says in verse 6, seek the Lord when? while he may be found. When you hear his voice, when you have opportunity, when, when the truth is presented to you, to take that opportunity to respond. It says, call on him while he is near. Let the wicked one abandon his way and the sinful one his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord so he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will freely forgive. 
And yet we see an example here that they weren't responding in faith. They were still wanting to test. Now, we don't know ultimately about uh, these individuals. Maybe later in their life, they came to an understanding. Maybe some of them were in Jerusalem at the crucifixion or the resurrection. Maybe there was further opportunity. But for today, there wasn't any more. Jesus wasn't hanging around for more dialogue. He got in the boat and he went to someone else. We see a response here as well, and that is sorrow. The response of sorrow. If you look at the beginning of verse 12, it says, sighing deeply in his spirit. Now, this kind of jumped out at me because last week we also had the word sighing in the text we were reading at the end of chapter 7. Remember him healing the, the deaf man and how as he approaches him, he sighs? And we said there was just evidence there that he was sighing with compassion, that he, he saw this man's situation and it was as if, as if he was feeling it with him. And yet, I don't think that's what this sighing is. I think this is more a reflection of just frustration. Uh, it could be sorrow that here we see once again just rejection of Christ. J.C. Ryle in his commentary said there was a deep meaning in that sigh. It came from a heart which mourned over the ruin that these wicked men were bringing on their own souls. That's, that's striking. So interesting that, that, that Jesus is seeing it all happen here. And his response is uh, denial and sorrow. But when we make the contrast to the group of Gentiles, what was his response there? We said it was provision and compassion. And yet this is a different response. So keep those two perspectives in mind. But let's keep reading because there is a third group. And yes, this is a familiar group as well. Jump down to verse 14. And we're now going to see uh, how the disciples have responded to all of this. The disciples uh, had forgotten to take bread and had only one loaf with them in the boat. Remember, they're back in the boat again, crossing the sea. Then he gave them strict orders. Watch out. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Remember, they just had this encounter with the Pharisees. He's providing a, a warning. And he goes on to say, and the leaven of Herod. They were discussing among themselves that they did not have any bread. Do you have the idea that maybe we have two different conversations going on in this passage? Jesus is coming in. It's almost like he's, he's the dad in the car trying to make spiritual application of something that we, that we, just, uh, we just noticed in life. And, and uh, you got the kids going, All right, when are we going to eat, right? I'm hungry. And he's making a point, right? It's like two different things. So anyway, notice how many questions Jesus asks the disciples. It's almost like he's taking like this Socratic approach. He's going to continue asking questions to expand their thinking about what they have just experienced. And with that memory being recalled, he's really wanting to strengthen their faith. Let's pick back up. Verse 17, aware of this, he said to them, why are you discussing the fact you have no bread? Don't, don't you understand or comprehend? Do you have hardened hearts? Do you have eyes and not see? Do you have ears and not hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of leftovers did you collect? 12, they told him. When I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many baskets full of pieces did you collect? Seven, they said. And he said to them, don't you understand yet? Well, we have another scene. Scene three, the disciples didn't fully understand Jesus. They didn't fully understand his identity. And we're going to see as we move through the rest of this uh, passage uh, how, how Jesus makes note of that. But the encounter with the Pharisees had been brief. They're back in the boat going to a different destination. The Lord is still thinking about that encounter. And evidently, he is still troubled in his spirit with the way the interaction with the Pharisees went, how they were responding to him. And he begins reflecting upon the stronghold of influence that two different groups might have upon the disciples. Now, again, a few weeks ago, we looked at the, the stronghold of the Pharisees. We looked at legalism. We looked at, at, at the, uh, the traditions of the elders that had been elevated over God's commandments. And there's a lot of warnings there, even in, in our present age that we looked at. But he's also worried, concerned, I should say, about, about the, uh, the influence of Herod. We think about the, the days of the Roman Empire and what that represented. 
And uh, you think about authority or you think about power. You think about the treatment of, of other people among classes and so forth. There's so much there that, that, that the disciples needed to be, be wary of so that they didn't adopt that thinking. So there were two real threats, both which were striving against the ways of the Lord. They were both preying upon the people of that day. And Jesus saw it. And he wanted to make sure that the disciples didn't follow either of those two patterns. So he warns against the leaven. What is leaven? You think about this ingredient that is put into dough, right? Something small, but it, it, it causes the dough to ferment and to rise. And so it was, it was a picture of, of how evil or an evil thought, uh, when, when allowed in, could have a, a greater impact upon a person. Now, this was a symbol, of course, leaven or yeast, a symbol for evil. And even in uh, the book of Leviticus, there were certain offerings that were given where, um, uh, where the, the, the leaven could not be added into a bread. You think about the Passover celebration because it was a symbol of evil. When we received the Lord's Supper a few weeks ago, we used unleavened bread because, again, if, if leaven represents sin or evil and Jesus is free of sin, this is a, uh, is a picture of his sinless humanity. Again, something very small that can have a dramatic effect. Now, Paul also picked up on this symbol. In the New Testament book of Galatians, he writes to the church there, Galatians chapter five, you were running well. Who prevented you from obeying the truth? The persuasion does not come from the one who calls you a little leaven, leavens the whole batch of dough. So again, what are we seeing here? A warning. Paul is warning the church of Galatia. Make sure you don't let the things of this world get mixed in to your life to the point that it keeps you from running your race for Christ. He's telling the disciples, make sure you don't let the leaven of the Pharisees, their ritualism, their, their, uh, uh, their, their legalism, don't let the leaven of the, of, of, of the empire of Herod to, to impact you. And I think that one of the reasons why he was trying to be so clear with them is that we're very close to when he's going to make an announcement to his disciples that he would not be with them much longer. And so he is urgently preparing them for that day after the cross. And so he wants them to be on guard. He wants them to be aware that they can't get influenced by, uh, come under the influence of these other groups. Let me just ask you, what does it look like when the church today gets mixed up in false systems of belief? Because I think the warning that Jesus was giving the disciples is a, is a warning that lives for us even today. Let me just ask it as a question. Do you think that there are some outside influences that we need to be on guard against? Some of you are chuckling because you're saying like, well, yes, how many do you think there are, right? I mean, there's all kinds of ideologies out there. There's all kinds of, of, uh, of thinking that, that we need to be able to identify. Because if, if, if a church picks up on the thinking of the age and replaces it with the authority of God's word, this substitution happens and it, 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 really, it really affects the church. In fact, I, I think one of several things can happen. If, if a church begins to replace the authority of God's word with the thinking of the age, first of all, you lose the power of, of God's word. You, you, you lose the power of the spirit working through the word. You become, in, in, in many ways, a, a, a church that isn't really a church anymore because it's not, it's not standing on the truth of scripture. It's instead just heralding the, the thinking of the age. And I think that when churches do that, that, that in many ways, they're really not a church anymore because it's not God's truth that they are proclaiming. And so we've got to be on guard. We've got to make sure that that leaven doesn't come in because at times it can be very deceiving. It can be very appealing. There can be a lot of pressure even placed upon the follower of Christ to, to succumb to the thinking of the age, to agree, to, to, uh, to accept and we've always got to use the word of God as that filter for what is true and what is not. Truth and error. These are two things. I would also add to that that there are some churches whose doors are closed altogether. 
because they began that slippery slope into just whether it's relativism or just the ideologies of the day. And so I think just as Jesus was preparing the disciples, that, that these words also can prepare us to be, to be uh, aware, to be on guard, to be considering what it could be that might uh, diminish the effectiveness of our ministry here or even upon our, uh, our handling of God's word. Now, I know that... Uh, is I ask the question, what influences must the church be warned about today that we could, we could just spend a lot of time with a big list? I, I get that. And I want to ask you just to think through some of those. And I know that we are in a political season, right? We've got an election on the horizon, and that in itself brings about a lot of challenges. And sometimes we have political issues, and sometimes we have moral issues, and I know sometimes when we speak to a moral issue, some might say, wait a minute, that's, that sounds very political. Well, if it's a moral issue, we look to God's word as authoritative, and we want to be, we, be equipped in that so that we can look at the issues of the day. And so we want to do that. Now, the political issues, there, there's a lot of those too. And I've got a lot of opinions on political issues, as I'm sure you do. But that's not really why I've been called here. I mean, if you want to talk about taxation, we could have that conversation, right? It's like, what do you think about property tax in St. Louis County. I mean, we've all got, got perspectives on that. If you want to talk about foreign policy, we've all got perspectives on that. We can look at the government. I mean, you know, you look at the FDA. They put together this food pyramid years ago. I've got some thoughts on their food pyramid. Maybe you do too, right? But that's not what I'm here for. We need to think about the moral clarity that's needed in a day like today. And so, you say, well, what if, if we're not dealing with the Pharisees and, uh, and Herod, what are we dealing with? Well, one thing we're dealing with is the topic of anthropology. What does it mean to be a person? That, that, that right now is looming large. What does it mean to be a person? What does it mean to be created in the image of God? What does it mean that we view all people as image bearers of God? How does that give respect to human life? What does, it, what does it look like when we talk about being created male and female? Is that something that we see coming out of God's word and shaping our theology of personhood? How does that affect even the structure of family or marriage? You see, these, some might say, well, those are political issues. They're moral issues, theological issues. And they're ones that as a church, we need to be equipped in and be able to understand because if not, these can be all be examples of leaven that gets in. What about the, the Bible's teaching on morality? Will the church today uphold a biblical sexual ethic? And that can mean a lot of things. But if we say we believe that God's word is true and that there is a sexual ethic that's been given, again, there's, there's, there's ideologies out there that can be like leaven that comes in. And if you, if you really contend for, for these topics in your home and in your faith, and we do as a church, we cannot expect that the world is going to stand up and applaud for us. But instead, the reverse is oftentimes true. What you'll do is you'll, you'll find, you'll find that, that, that your, your opinion isn't, isn't the popular one. You will, you will see at times that, uh, uh, that, that you will be cast aside or you will be mocked, or there may be opportunities that you don't receive. See, all these things can happen in this world. There are moral issues out there. We think about being a voice for the innocent. And that might be a voice for those uh, children that, that are waiting for adoption, those that are, that are, that are needing uh, foster care. We think about uh, children in the womb, vulnerable. We think about all of this in different stages of life. You could add even to that widows or elderly uh, in, in times of need. All of these are examples of, of how we believe, what we believe the Bible teaches about being a person. And so when we see things that are moral issues uh, becoming uh, talked about in political circles, we still need to be aware. And I, I, am, I am convinced that we need to not only be aware, we need to be participants. We've got a ballot initiative coming up in the state of Missouri that would make it, if it passes, a constitutional right for abortion. Well, I think as the body of Christ and as people that take to God's word, we see what God's word teaches on this, that we, we need to bring that to our understanding of issues like that. And we must be involved. We must participate. When we believe that human life 
uh, begins at conception, that it is sacred, we as the people of Christ must be clear and participants in the dialogues and the elections. So again, it may not be the influence of Pharisees. It may not be like Herod uh, that they had in the days of the disciples, but we have our own challenges to confront. And I'm reminded of what Paul told Timothy and encouraging him to hold the ground. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, he said, protect what has been entrusted to you. Protect it. And so here we are on a family worship Sunday, living in 2024, recognizing some of the, the ideologies and the threats that are, that are out there and saying, we, as the Fellowship of Wildwood, we want to take that sacred trust that's been entrusted to us, and we want to protect it. We want to, we want to keep it as God has instructed us to. He goes on to say in that verse, avoid the empty chatter that is falsely called knowledge. And uh, is there a lot of empty chatter out there today? Yeah. <laughs> Anybody have social media? Yeah, lots of empty chatter. We got we to be careful with all of that. All of those, those, those influences, all of that we need to, to be aware of. Um, but I would just uh, finish this part by saying that, that it is our role uh, to, to hold on to that truth. It's also our role to be a compassionate voice. Just as Jesus went across and he demonstrated compassion to the Gentiles, we have opportunity as well to demonstrate compassion. You know, maybe it's not people that are with us every Sunday. Maybe it's people that we interact out there. We want our voices to still be filled with compassion as well as truth. And I know that that's not always an easy balance. But let's get back on the boat. There was a discussion in verse 17 that there wasn't enough bread. There was not just this discussion that Jesus wanted to give about the leaven. There was also a panic about provision. And Jesus asked eight questions to help them understand that they didn't need to worry. Remember, they had already seen his ability to provide. They were there firsthand two times, right? And yet here they are. Can you imagine what that conversation was like? Who forgot the bread? We had, we had 12 basketfuls left over. Who, who's the, I told you to get it. Well, you said you, I, it was probably that kind of a dialogue. And Jesus was saying, wait, don't you remember? Don't you get it? Are your hearts hardened? Do you not understand what I'm able to do? You see, their faith in Christ was incomplete. And for the disciples, close proximity did not guarantee perception. Proximity is no guarantee that one will perceive accurately. And that's a word for us as well, because we may, we may experience God's work in our lives. We may, we may hear his truth on a regular basis. We may read it daily. And yet all of that, that also needs to include a receptivity. The point is clear for us, just like it was for the disciples. Just because we have witnessed God at work or have been repeatedly exposed to his teaching, it's no guarantee we will receive what's there. If we're not careful, we can even become so familiar to it that we will be unchanged. Kent Hughes said, if the disciples had truly reflected on the spiritual significance of the miracle feasts, they would have advanced far beyond where they were in their spiritual growth. They would, have, they would have seen Jesus as the wielder of omnipotence. The multiplication of bread was a creation miracle. Christ could do anything. The 12 baskets and the seven hampers of bread taught that he was bread for the whole world, Jews and Gentiles. The bread taught that there was no life apart from him. So here we see Jesus is trying to help Bring the pieces together. He's trying to, by asking these questions, have them reflect upon what they had seen, what they had experienced, what they had heard, and to, to take that information and bring it into the present crisis of having no bread. Is there a word here for us? Do we ever at times have a failure to remember? Is there a time for us when which we need to learn in light of previous revelation? David McKenna said, memory and understanding go together in discerning spiritual truth. God does not ask that we understand truth without evidence. Our problem is that we forget so quickly. And all I have to say is, amen, I know that I do, right? There's times that I need to reflect and remember. 
He goes on to say, if only we would remember what God has done for us in the past, we would better understand what he is trying to do for us in the future. And so here we have, yet again, a call to remember, to remember what God has done. But we can't quite close because there's one more account that really ties all of this up. So jump down to verse 22, pick up where we left off. And this time, uh, there is a group of people, but they bring an individual. And that's who we'll focus on. So look at verse 22. They came to Bethsaida. They brought a blind man to him and begged him, begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by his hand and brought him out of the village, spitting on his eyes and laying his hands on him. He asked him, do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They, they look like trees walking. Again, Jesus placed his hands on the man's eyes. The man looked intently and his sight was restored and he saw everything clearly. Then he sent him home saying, don't even go into the village. So the fourth scene is this. The blind man was gradually healed by Jesus. Now, this is a very unique miracle. When you think about all that we've seen in the gospel of Mark thus far, typically it's a pronouncement. Jesus makes a statement, there's healing. Or Jesus makes a touch on an individual like last week, and there's immediate healing. But this time, it's different. It wasn't immediate. And there's a lot of questions raised about why the man would first receive partial healing and then full healing. In fact, believe it or not, there's some people that have used this passage to say, see, Jesus made a mistake. See, Jesus didn't have all the power that he claimed to have. He wasn't able to do it the first time. He had to try again. Let me assure you, that is not what has happened here. Jesus is using this miracle as a picture of the conversation he just had with his disciples. They were slow to understand. They were partially understanding There would be a time that they would fully understand, just as this healing was partial at first and then became full sight. The disciples are being, or giving, excuse me, the disciples are given the opportunity to see themselves, and slowly their faith is growing. Their spiritual vision, their perception is developing. And this healing of the blind man in Bethsaida serves to bring it all together. He is the one who is typifying their spiritual insight. Yes, they would make progress, and we will continue to see that. And of course, as you have read, even into the book of Acts, you certainly can see the progress that they make in their faith. Um, And yet, they're not there yet. And Jesus has another question for them. We've already read eight, right? He has another question for them, a question that will get to the heart of their understanding of the true identity of Jesus. It's a question and we're going to consider next week. So you're just going to have to think about it or read ahead, I guess, right? That's right, to be continued. We'll pick back up next week. I know it's a holiday weekend. I can see it. You're saying, Ryan, we've got time. Let's just go ahead and do it. No, I'm not going to. I, I'm sorry to disappoint. I know, I know you don't like these cliffhangers. But we need to close with some application. So first of all, As Jesus cared for the Gentiles, number one, should this impact our view of people in the world? Is there a lesson there for us? We saw that he did the very same thing for them that he did for the Jews. We saw that he had compassion on their spiritual condition, just like he did for his own people. And I think there's a lesson there for us. Yes, to love and to care for one another. We have all those one another commands but let us also have compassion upon those that have not yet come or those that have not yet heard. Number two, how can the response of the Pharisees serve as a warning to us? Think about that. They had limited time with Christ. In fact, I still can't get that picture out of my mind of Jesus just getting on the boat and just just sailing away. That's, that's, That's striking to me. There's a warning there. Number three, What can you remember about Christ at work in your past that will help you consider your present or future circumstances? I think that's important. And I think that's, again, that's the boat dialogue that was going on. He's saying, can you remember what you've seen and connect it to what you're going through right now? Number four, 
How do you understand faith in Christ as a process? Is the two-part healing of the blind man an encouragement to you? Do you kind of see yourself in that? That there was a step of faith and then, and then it was a fully final one. And I'm not talking about this, I'm not trying to confuse the idea of, of when conversion happens. I'm just saying that oftentimes there is a bit of a process until we get to that understanding of who Christ is. And finally, number five. And I thought, I thought about this question as we were seeing the Babs uh, Commission for Missionary Service, a, a family that is still relatively new to our church. I think just over a year ago, they, they, uh, they joined the church and now being sent out for the second time on, on mission for Christ. Um, with their example in mind, let me ask number five, how would you describe your response to Christ? We all have a calling and it looks different. The specifics look different in following Christ. But when we see him open up an opportunity and present something in front of us, are we eager? Are we willing to step out in faith? Because I think that's part of what we see with the variety of responses that are here. And may the Lord use these responses to remind us of the opportunities that we have as well.